Today, we want to pose the, and, and then answer the question, is Jesus God? Why? Why would this be an essential thing for Christians? Well, the teaching of who Jesus is is one of the main things that makes Christianity distinct from other faiths. So like, Judaism, as we understand it now, maybe that's a bad definition. I wouldn't say Jesus is God. Or maybe you have a different definition. Uh, in Islam, they would say Jesus is a prophet and that he's going to come to judge. And we would be like, yeah, that's interesting. We believe that too. But we believe he's God. You know, it's distinct. This is what makes Christianity distinct is the, the theology of who God is and what he's like. And so the very fact that God became flesh is just a part of his character. And the things he revealed in the flesh to us helps us understand what he's like. Except I just wanted to say this little caveat. I always get nervous talking about the Trinity because it's like, can you talk about the Trinity for 10 minutes without accidentally saying something heretical? So, <laughs> Okay, so here's, here's why I get nervous about that. Imagine we're two-dimensional creatures and a three-dimensional object passes through our realm. You would just be like, what was that? Imagine a sphere going through a two-dimensional thing. It would be like a dot and then a circle. Oh, the circle's getting bigger. Oh, now it's getting smaller and then it's a dot. Where'd it go? You'd have no idea. And in the, a three-dimensional creature could try to say, that was all the same object. And you would say, no, it was not all the same object. I, saw, I distinctly saw two different dots and a lot of circles. That couldn't be the same thing but it would. And in something that transcends you, it's hard to understand. It's hard to grasp. Likewise with the triangle, you could, you could put it square side down and just be a bunch of squares getting smaller until it's a point. And then you could flip it on its side and pass it through again. And it's a bunch of triangles. You're like, what is that? How could that be the same object? I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit is a sphere or a pyramid, by the way. Same thing with the donut. You could pass a donut through a two-dimensional plane. It'd be like a dot, and then an, like an ovalish thing, and then a really weird shape, and then two circles that aren't even touching, and then it goes backwards. Confusing. The Trinity is also not a donut. We should put that on Twitter. The, the, the Trinity is not a donut. Signed, Matt Reiniger. Come join our church. So... Jesus is God incarnate, and that's an important message for Christianity. It's an important message that relates to how we understand God and his character, and it also informs our praises. We praise him for who he is, really, not who we imagine him to be or want him to be, but who, as he really is, and as he really is, is kind of beyond our understanding a lot. I don't know why I said kind of a lot. It's a lot beyond our understanding. So... I wanted to show you from the New Testament that the New Testament authors believe that Jesus Christ is Yahweh incarnate. And I have uh, some examples for you that are kind of easy to roll off real quick. Um, the first one would be John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who's the Word that was in the beginning and with God and, and was God? Well, in Revelation 19, it kind of fills in. We refer to the Word as Jesus. Jesus is the Word. So he's with God, he's in the beginning, and he is God. Another one would be um, Exodus 3, 14. This is when God is revealing the divine name to Moses. He says, I am who I am. He's the great I am, right? We sing about that. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. And then in John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. He's just declaring the divine name here. And somebody might think, well, that's kind of proof texty, Matt. That's fine. It's not, but, um, but that's fine. I also wanted to show you, not from specific verses, but that there's also um, the narrative of the New Testament itself shows you that Jesus is Yahweh incarnate. And uh, this is... In great literature, you can make a point without the, the narrator just coming right out and saying it. Um, one of the things I learned about in history class was that Harriet Beecher Stowe, and she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, she was able to communicate the evils of slavery without just writing a treatise, and partly because it was a story, and it was a narrative, and it was compelling, and it brought you in. And in that same way, too, like the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife is not like a, rom a romance era, romanticism era treatise on like the exposition of purity, you know? It's a story, but it's compelling. And it, does that story talk about the importance of purity? Yes, but the narrative does it. 
Does that make sense? So in that same way, the, just even the narrative of the New Testament shows us that Jesus is Yahweh incarnate. And so since there's a lot of New Testament out there and you want to have cake, I thought I would just choose one book. And I'm not, we're not going to read the whole thing. I'm still nervous. That's still a whole book. We're not going to read the whole book. But I wanted to show you Mark. We're going to use Mark as a good test case. And it, this is doubly a good test case because a lot of people will believe that Mark is uh, the first gospel chronologically. It's not proof. Like, there's no uh, time stamp on his document that we have, like, there's, like on a computer. But there's good reasons to believe it's very early and maybe the earliest one. And if Mark thinks Jesus is Yahweh, then it's also ridiculous when people say that the church made that up later. Okay, thank you. But before we start, we're going to do some literary criticism like techniques. First, we want to learn a little bit about the author. The author knows a lot about the Old Testament, and that's helpful because when we read his book and he does these, second point, lots of Old Testament allusions, it's going to help us understand what he's doing. That's a really good point. And so, number three, Mark also communicates with the reader directly. If you've ever read any mystery novel, you know that you as the reader know things that the characters don't. Same thing with a comedy of errors. The reason it's funny is because you're in on the joke. You know things the characters don't. But perplexingly, I don't know if that's a word, sometimes when people read the Gospels, they think, well, oh, if the characters don't figure out that Jesus is God, then, then the author's not saying that. But that's a really weird way of reading literature. And you don't read that way with any other genre. So the, the, the narrator is com communicating directly to you as the reader. And so even if the characters in the story don't get it, that doesn't mean you're not allowed to get it. Okay, so that's what we're going to think in the back of our minds when we read through little chunks, chunklets of Mark. I don't know why I did that. I'm sorry. Exhibit A. Let's just move past that. Exhibit A. Jesus gets quite the introduction, and the familiarity with the Old Testament helps us understand why it's such a staggering and intense introduction. Mark uses Malachi 3 and Isaiah 40. Malachi 3 says this, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Who's talking? Yahweh, the great I am, the God of Israel, God, creator of heaven and earth. I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Mark also uses Isaiah 40 when he writes, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, and that Lord is Yahweh. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Okay, so this messenger is going to do the following. He's going to prepare the way for Yahweh. And he's going to be sent by Yahweh. Does that make sense? Okay. So I have a point to make that's kind of deep and a little bit hard to understand. So, Mark is not saying that Jesus is the messenger. Mark then, right after quoting these two texts, talks about how John the Baptist was out preaching in the wilderness. And we understand from this gospel and others that John the Baptist is the messenger. So, according to Malachi 3, there are two characters, Yahweh and the messenger. The messenger prepares the way for Yahweh. John the Baptist is that messenger, and he prepares the way for, dare I say it, Jesus. Now, it gets even weirder. Mark changes the pronouns of Malachi 3, and this is the point where I feel like it's a little hard to follow. Malachi 3 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Right? When Mark quotes it, he says, Behold, I send my messenger before you, who will prepare your way. So, here's the, I'm going to try to make this point, that Mark is using the Old Testament in a distinctly Trinitarian way. Let's say this is John the Baptist. I don't know if this is a good analogy. Here's John the Baptist, and here's Yahweh. There's just two characters, right? In Malachi 3, which is still valid, it's scripture and it's prophetic, Yahweh sends him to prepare the way for Yahweh. 
Yes? But when Mark quotes Malachi 3, he inserts this other person. I'm sending him before you. It's still your way, but when he's preparing the way, he's preparing it for Yahweh, right? So the sender is Yahweh, and the one whose way is being prepared is also Yahweh, but for whatever reason, one of them's talking to the other. So Mark adapts the Old Testament language in a Trinitarian way on purpose. In other words, Yahweh is a multi-personal being, which categorically is something we are not. We're mortals. We're like the two-dimensional creatures. God transcends us. It's beyond our understanding. But, but I definitely guarantee you that Mark did that on purpose. So he did two things. He's showing you that Yahweh and his coming is fulfilled in Jesus' coming. And then he also helps us understand that that's not a contradiction because Yahweh can be sender talking to the one for whom the sent was being sent because he's multipersonal. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, Mark makes a distinction between the Son and the Father, but he does not make a distinction between Jesus and Yahweh. That's exhibit A. And that's quite an introduction because the rest of the time you're reading, you're like, oh my gosh, this guy fulfills the coming of Yahweh. But there's plenty more clues to come. Exhibit B. This is a story of the paralytic. I have a little picture there for you. You've probably read this before, but Jesus is in a house. It's super duper crowded. There's people in the doorway and these guys want to bring their friend to be healed. They can't get in, so they go on the roof and they open up the roof. When Jesus saw their faith in verse 5, he said to the paralytic, I'm just going to read to you a little chunk of it. I'm not going to say chunklet. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who, who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately... Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins? He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Now, in this passage, Jesus forgives the sins of a lame man. He confirms his authority to do that by healing him. The teachers, or the scribes here, protest that only God can forgive sins. And in this story, there's this tension and ambiguity. Are they right or are they wrong? It could go three ways. They're wrong. It's not true that only God can forgive sins. Or they're right. Only God can forgive sins, but Jesus was wrong to do that. Or they're right, and Jesus can forgive sins. And it was right that he did that. Okay. That tension kind of fills the conversation. And I would admit that that's an ambiguous tension. But then what Jesus does inside that tension is a clue about which of those three options to pick. Because if you're really familiar with the Old Testament like Mark is, you'll remember that time when Samuel was going to uh, anoint one of uh, Jesse's sons king. And he goes through all the older brothers and he thinks, oh, this is probably that one. Oh, it's probably that one. And then Yahweh speaks to him. First Samuel 16. He says, the Lord, Yahweh, sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's a Yahweh thing to do. And in this tension... What does Jesus do? He sees what's going on in their hearts. That's a clue which option to pick. Also, Jesus doesn't argue with them the way you might expect. He doesn't say, nah. -uh. And <laughs> well, he may have. It's just not recorded anywhere. <laughs> but instead of arguing about who does or does not have the power to forgive, he just proves that he can. Also, 
You may think, well, maybe a priest could do that at the temple if you bring a sacrifice. Yeah, but that's not what happened. They weren't at the temple. Nobody offered a goat or anything. Jesus just declared it, almost like he was picking a fight to show something. Jesus is a healer, forgiver, and reader of hearts. If you know the Old Testament God, you would think, ah, oh, that's funky. I've seen all that before. Okay. The characters in that story didn't get it, though. But that doesn't mean you're not allowed to. Exhibit C. Mark chapter 4. It's a really bizarre story about Jesus sleeping in a boat. For those of you that aren't familiar, I'm going to read a piece of it. On that day when the evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who is this then that even the wind and sea obey him? Okay, if the story ends with a question about Jesus' identity, it may be the case that Jesus' identity is a big part of this story. Just saying. Okay. Another thing is a lot of times we assume that the disciples woke him up in order for him to calm the sea. But the fact that they're really freaked out when he does it is a clue that maybe that's not what they were expecting to happen. It's possible. So in this passage, Jesus is asleep in a boat. He's awakened by the disciples. And the story ends with the disciples asking who Jesus could be after he calms the sea. What were the disciples expecting Jesus to do? In other words, why did they wake him up? There's a clue in the fact that Mark I think on purpose calls to mind, or maybe just the way it happened on purpose calls to mind, a story in the Old Testament that's very, very similar to this whole story, almost line for line. There's a story in the book of Jonah that I'm going to read to you part of. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 4, it says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise and call on your God. Be, perhaps the God will give us a thought to us, and that we may not perish. In the story, in verse 14, after Jonah explains to them what's happening, then in verse 14, they call on Yahweh. And in verse 16, when he stills the storm, they were, it says, the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Okay. What are the parallels? Experienced seamen in a violent storm. Check. The sailors are panicking. Check. They find someone perplexingly Asleep in the boat. Check. They wake up the sleeper. Check. The sleeper wakes up. Check. And intervenes in some way. Check. Yahweh intervenes. Check. They are afraid of Yahweh. Okay. The parallels help the contrast stick out. In the parallels, before I talk about why they stick out and the differences... There's something probably similar in the desire of the disciples to the desire of the captain. The disciples weren't saying, hey, can you steal this? Because we know you can. And like, come on. What they say to him is, we are perishing. And they're afraid when he actually steals it. The captain and his men, they wanted Jonah to call on his God, because who knows, maybe, maybe one of the gods will answer. I think it's possible that the disciples wanted to wake Jesus up, A, to panic with them, and B, to call on God for them, because he's a man of faith. Instead, Jesus just answers their request directly. And the story ends with them being afraid of him. The parallels are all there. Violent storm, violent storm. Sailors panicking. A guy asleep, a guy asleep, they wake him up. They wake him up. They call on Yahweh. They ask Jesus for help. Yahweh stills the storm. 
Jesus stills the storm. They're afraid of Yahweh. They were just filled with fear about who this man is. Mark's just connected. He's put all these dots. Can we connect them? And when, when Mark says that the disciples didn't get it, that's an invitation to you. Exhibit D. It's being weird. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus is again behaving oddly, as he's wont to do. He dismisses a crowd, and he insists that they go on ahead of him. When evening came, in verse 47, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, which has always bothered me. <laughs> but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For, all they, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. But literally he says, I am. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves. So he, multiplying a bread miracle earlier. Yet their hearts were hardened. Okay. If you're really familiar with this passage, it may not shock you anymore. You're just like, yeah, that's just Jesus doing Jesus things. But if you were super familiar with the Old Testament like Mark was, you might recall in the book of Job, chapter 9, where Job says, he's describing Yahweh, who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. That's a Yahweh thing to do. And in chapter 38 of Job, Yahweh himself says, have you entered the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Mm. Implication is, of course not. You're just a man. That's a Yahweh thing to do. When he encourages them, his encouragement was, don't be afraid, I am. Which kind of reminds you of Exodus chapter 33. Actually, I'm going to do 1 Kings 19 first. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah, this is after the Mount Carmel whole situation, and he's about to get a revelation from God. He said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, and behold, behold, the Lord passed by. This passing by thing is sort of a motif in the Old Testament, something that Yahweh would do as part of a revelation of who he is. The, the big tuna on this one would be Exodus 33. That was a terrible, sorry. In Exodus 33, it says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. So in Moses, he wants to know, show me your, show me your glory. And in that little passage, show me your glory is equated to show me who you are because it says the Lord passed by him. So what did, you, what did Yahweh do before Moses? He passed by him and pronounced, I am. And what is Jesus intending to do to the disciples? First of all, he's literally walking on water. That's a clue. <laughs> then he's intending to pass by them. And then when he encourages them, he says, I am. Jesus is just doing Yahweh things. There's also a, there's a tool in literary criticism too when you understate something to make a point, sort of like Einstein. Yeah, he's clever. I was just doing that on purpose. Jesus, he's just doing Yahweh things. But I meant that to underline like the fact that do you do Yahweh things? Not casually. <laughs> Not usually. Exhibit E, let's just move on. Exhibit E. The rich young ruler guy. This is a great story. Okay, so as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. 
do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Okay, this is another one of those times where Jesus says something that you kind of have to unencrypt. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. I guess there's another set of three options. The rich young man could just say, Jesus is wrong. That's not true. He could say, okay, Jesus is right, but I shouldn't call Jesus good because he's not God. Or the third option is, I guess he's right, and Jesus is good, so... Now, the rich young man hasn't been with us on this journey this whole time. But we know, after Jesus was in the Decapolis, they joyfully declared, he has done all things well. So we, as the readers, know he is good. We also know he doesn't lie, so that eliminates the first option. So, that really only leaves one. And Mark just holds it out right in front of you. It's deeper than that, though. This young man's kept the commands. But does he also remember from the Torah other things? Yahweh would repeatedly say to his people to follow him, that life is in him, and to turn away from their idols and to follow him. What was this man's idol? What is Jesus doing? Turn away from your idolatry and follow me. Do prophets do that? Kings? No. There was a character in the Old Testament that would repeatedly do that. And it was... There are others. I'm going to give them to you a little bit faster. Partly because there's cake. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom of Israel, which up until that point was always a Yahweh thing. Just casually puts that out there. He gathers to him 12, which is almost like a renewing of the 12 tribes of Israel, a prophetic act. But who is the one who gathered the 12 tribes? Jesus gathers these 12. He sends them on mission and he, he calls his followers to abandon false gods and to follow him. And he sends, he's a sender of the 12 and he's ready to judge those who reject the sender. Is Jesus literally just usurping every divine prerogative? Within the gospel, God is credited for salvation, like when they, Jesus healed the paralytic and they praised God. But by means of the narrative itself, Jesus is the agent of all of that. In Mark 13, Jesus just casually claims to be able to send angels. And later in that same chapter, he refers to God's elect as his elect. There's one more. I think I actually have time to do this because it's, did you know it's only 1120? Wow. I'm not going to just, I'm not filibustering or anything, but I do have more. So, hey, why not? Uh, okay. Exhibit F. Yes, it's on there. Okay. Within Mark, there's this huge chiasm. And as far as chiasms go, this is one of the more obvious. Because how often do you go around multiplying bread? <clears throat> and he does it twice. And Mark arranges it so that those two stories are like bookends for a section. A lot of times if you have bookends on a section, they kind of descend towards this middle climactic thing. And um, we'll get there in just a second. These bookends have other bookends right inside to make you double extra certain sure there's something going on here. Jesus feeds 5,000. Jesus feeds 4,000. Those are A and A prime. I'm doing this. B and B prime is Jesus heals people. Jesus heals a guy. So Jesus healing, providing abundantly the bread from heaven, being the healer, 
And then in the middle, there's the two other pairs. They go together, but as an, uh, like a yin and yang kind of, oh, I shouldn't say that in church. It's like a, <laughs> just two different sides of the same kind of a coin situation. <laughs> Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees about purity laws, saying, you know, it's not what goes into a man that makes them defiled, but it's what comes out. And it just makes, it just begs the question, oh, is there something that can come out that cleanses? The paired story is this lady. She expresses faith. And the answer is yes. But how? And right in the middle, Jesus declares all foods clean. And if you were to read this in the same kind of way that we read Acts chapter 10, where Peter is told to eat unclean food, he refuses and then God tells him to do it. And what that really was all about is that God was actually calling Peter to bring the gospel to Cornelius, a Gentile, then this is also about that too. He's declaring all foods clean, but also in a way, the food, uh, the food bookends at the front and at the back form a food theme as divine providence. Jesus declares all food is clean, and it's a hidden message about the inclusion of the Gentiles. There's two prominent Gentiles Jesus interacts with in the Gospel of Mark. A centurion, who represents a current enemy, and a Syrophoenician woman. Now, he does call her dog, that always bothered me too until I did some research on dog as an insult in the Old Testament. That was fun. Dog as an insult in the Old Testament is not about a foreigner. It's about an enemy because they're dangerous like dogs. See, they didn't have like lots of lap dogs, household pet puppy dog things. Dogs are like dangerous creatures. Okay, what does the centurion represent? Rome. What does the Syrophoenician woman represent? Well, small history lesson. The Seleucid Empire was brutal against Israel, and that was a recent memory thing. She would be like an enemy. But who gets extravagant miracles? The centurion and this lady, both Gentiles who represent enemies of God. And if the enemies of God who are super far away and God's own people, Israel, if they're all given these gifts and promises, then that's basically saying, I'm here for everyone. But this kind of reminds you of uh, the manna, God, God feeding people miraculously. But we know that it's not, we're not surviving on bread, but from the very words of Yahweh himself. Yahweh also reveals himself in Exodus 15 as the healer. Oh, you know what we should do? Just remembered stonks. We should uh, let the cake people cut because by the, by the time that I'm done preaching, they're going to have to rush over there. So if you're a cake person, you can go start cutting. Make sure they're small so we all get a piece. <laughs> I remembered. Yeah, cut the chocolate one first. Speaking of heavenly bread. <laughs> Jesus is demonstrating the miraculous heavenly bread that sustained God's people. And it wasn't just the bread, it was God's own words. It was really Yahweh himself sustaining them. And Jesus is like, right there throughout all of this demonstrating, he is the bread of heaven. He is the healer and he is for everyone by faith. Why does any of this matter for a Christian? I believe lots of reasons. In conclusion, talking about the Trinity is kind of complicated and it's deep. Whenever I do, I always feel like just like a bug trying to describe the stars. It's like, or like a box of roly polies. It's like there's not a lot of computation power in a, a bag of gnats. Like a gnat bag cannot do science. So I'm just sitting here thinking like, okay, I'm trying to study the Trinity, but I'm just, a, you know, I'm just a guy, mere mortal. So maybe I said things that don't make sense to you. Hey, they don't make sense to me all the time either. But I do know this. Mark believed that Jesus is Yahweh. Yes. He makes distinctions between the Father and the Son. Yes. yes. But he does not make distinctions between Jesus and Yahweh. Because God is multipersonal. Okay, this affects the way we see God. 
the fact that he became man, the ways he treated people when he was here in flesh, that represents God because that's Yahweh. So, like Jesus said, you'll know somebody by their fruit. You can know a person and what they're like by their deeds and their words, their actions. Well, remember Jesus. Remember how he treated that lady who was caught in adultery? He fed people, and he cared for them, and he cast out demons for free without interrogating them first. Hey, come here, come here. You got a demon, I know, I can see it. But, look, I saw you yesterday lose your patience, and so, uh, how about we get rid of half the demons? You work on your patience, bring back a coin, me and the gang, and we'll get rid of the rest. That was so weird. Sorry, I didn't even, I didn't plan to do that one. But you see Jesus, you see his generosity, you see his mercy, you see his kindness, you see his willingness to forgive people who are like literally crucifying him. That's the heart of Yahweh. See, if you have an unhealthy trinity, you have perhaps this very like legal-minded, vindictive deity who like kind of wants to crush you ever since we took his fruit. He's just been like, it's going to be hammer time. And then along comes Jesus of what genre of person, we don't know. And then he convinces God to love you. That is crazy town. He is the full representation of what God is like because the secret of the kingdom is this. The king was present. That was the secret of the kingdom. The king was literally right there. They didn't even notice. It affects the way we see the church because he's the builder of the church and it's his own body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from him. See, we're not the heroes of the story, like I had said earlier. This crushing weight of having to feel like you are the hero of the story is ridiculous, first of all. It's also just going to destroy you, and make you feel like God's passive aggressive. God is the hero of the story. And I, I've brought this up before, but remember when um, Goliath was blaspheming the, the, the God of Israel and all of Israel's soldiers were quaking in their boots, right? And if you were back there, if you were in that story, you totally would have been one of those soldiers like trying not to pee their pants. You would not be David. You'd be quaking in your boots right next to me. Oh gosh, someone's going to kill that guy, right? <laughs> Woo, because I'm not... Uh, and then along comes David, with, the, with coming in the name and power of Yahweh. That's Jesus. That's like a type of Jesus. He's the hero. This affects the way you see mission. If Jesus is the seeker and saver of the lost, but Jesus is Yahweh, then you see Yahweh's heart for the lost. This also affects the way we worship him being just utterly amazed and perplexed at how generous and kind he would be to be, become man and be with us and the humility involved with that. Well, thank you for listening. There's a whole other bunch of verses we could go through. I'm not just stopping here because I ran out of ways to show that Jesus is Yahweh incarnate. We could even do part two next week where we do the exact same thing, go through a narrative and then show you random other ones. We could, go the, we could do that weeks at a time. I want you to know that the Bible clearly says this because we need to know it. So, we're going to end with that. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to eat cake. That's going to be super good. So God, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for who you are. Thank you for all that you've done. And I'm going to ask that you reveal yourself to us more that we may know and love you as you really are in all of your glory. I ask that you'd help us just have eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name.